everyone. I thought today we should have a nice little chat about another incredible isopod. This particular isopod is Porcelio succinctus, and it hails from southern Spain. This is an old isopod, even though it hasn't been very much in captivity. We're going to talk about it in detail, but uh, this species has been around and described since 1885. As mentioned, this is another fantastic large Spanish species. For this one, they can get an impressive size of two and a half centimeters or one inch. And for some real dominant males, as you just saw that one going down there underneath the log, maybe even up to 3.2 centimeters or inch and a quarter. But that's including the uropods. Here's an example of a female. And then right after this, we will have an example of a male. See the size difference, the, the big giant uh, uropods. And here's a nice juvenile or a younger male on the bottom there and a real old dominant male on the top. Now these are a very, very robust isopod. And like other isopods, they possess a rigid segmented exoskeleton. Remember, these are not bugs, but truthfully crustaceans, or as I like to call them, land shrimp. They're able to breathe using modified gills known as pleopodal lungs. And these are located on the underside of the abdomen. Now, Procilio succinctus, it looks very similar to two other particular species. And it almost looks like as if it were a hybrid between these two. First off, Procilio expansus. It's easy to see the similarities between the two. This one's just a slightly different color variation, and it also comes from Spain. Beautiful isopod in its own right. And the other is Porcelio Hoffman Segai, the Titan isopod. A true staple in the industry. Beautiful, large Spanish species as well. Now let's take a look at some of the maps and see where these species actually occur. So using the maps from the app iNaturalist, these are all observations. This is the range of Succinctus, obviously in the south side. Expanses is clearly more to the north side. And Hoffman Segai is far off onto the to the southeastern side. The one's off to the east coast there on those islands. I looked at those observations, and they, they're rather questionable as to whether or not they were actually Hoffman Segai, probably another species. So although they hail from the same country and they're reasonably close, perhaps they share some very, very common ancestors in their lineup in their family tree. But although they are visually similar, Succinctus, as well as the other two, all have distinctly different morphology, and they are all distinct species. Like some of the other large Spanish species, in me particularly, I've had the same cases with species such as Magnificus, Succinctus are a true seasonal breeder, and they generally only produce young or mankai, maybe only once or twice a year. The females will have between 10 and 20 maximum, even though they are large species. So because of their low breeding rate, this is a species that some revere as rather challenging. It's not necessarily harder to keep than other species. It just requires a lot of patience for success. Like many of the larger Spanish species, it inhabits the coastal areas. This one inhabits the coastal limestone cliffs and caves. So calcium is going to be absolutely critical for success with this species. So let's take a peek and see how I go about setting these isopods up for success. I absolutely love using these units for isopods. I found these on Amazon. I had to order them by the six pack. They have nice uh, sealed gaskets. They're nice, thick, rigid, almost like a commercial grade plastic. And you can see that I've drilled through for ventilation on both sides to provide lots of cross flow ventilation. A lot of the Spanish species, the large species, uh, even though they are still crustaceans and they require moisture, uh, they tend to like it a lot more airy, a lot more air flow through in their environments. Uh, some species, Hassii, uh, some of those other types, some of the Hoffman Sagai, Succinctus, Werneri, some of these ones, if you're not keeping them a little bit drier, 
uh, you're going to probably have some problems. Now we talked about calcium. I use many different forms of calcium. Now as they come from uh, limestone caves or limestone cliffs on the coast, it's very, very challenging to mimic that. Now I could use just limestone rocks, but uh, limestone rocks also then become very, very heavy. So the two products that I've shown you there are a calcium carbonate substrate. That is something that's generally often used for the reptile trade is providing a source of calcium for the for the reptiles when they go and ingest an animal, a cricket or so forth. But uh, it's a nice granular, almost sand, and I can mix it throughout the substrate. It poses two benefits. One, it has a readily available cal calcium source throughout the substrate at all times, but it also helps to stabilize the chemistry of the substrate. As the animals use up the organic matter that's within these environments, they produce waste product, also known as frass. Waste products, as those things build up and all those uh, all the accoutrements of the environments are used up, that starts to acidify the environment. And by using the calcium carbonate, it helps to stabilize it. Remember, these particular ice spots come from limestone cliffs, so these environments are tend to be alkaline. I also have used, as you saw, I used cuddle bones. Cuddle bones, a nice organic soil mix. I'm a big fan of this product called Sea Soil. It has all sorts of other added minerals and nutrients, and it's a nice loamy soil mix to which I will add all sorts of different types of mosses and barks and leaf litter and crushed up stuff, white rot wood, all sorts of components for a nice healthy mix. Like many large Spanish species, they are very protein driven. So let's discuss the foods that I use in rotation for the best success. All porcilio species, tend to need more protein sources available to them than some of the species such as armadillidium. These are some of the types of foods that I will use to supplement their diet. So this one here is from a good friend over at Ecogniverts, which is a friend in Canada, and he manufactures his own food, and it's an awesome, awesome product. I use it all the time for all my different animals. It works absolutely great, but uh, you can reach out in Cogniverse. We'll put the address there. Uh, any sort of good quality fish flakes. This one happens to be krill flakes, and it's basically a dehydrated uh, uh, krill meal, which is a type of shrimp. Any of those type of things you can buy at a pet store that would be dehydrated shrimp and krill and things like that. They're meat sources. If they're dried, they'd be fine. This one here is uh, dehydrated uh, minnows or smelts. And uh, it's all crumbled up. I crumble it up that way. It's a little bit easier for feeding for some of the, depending on the species I'm doing. But it's actually a product that uh, our company carries at work uh, where it's supposed to be the whole fish. And uh, oftentimes uh, when it, during all the shipping stuff is they break up. So once they get all broken up like this, I often pick them up and I use them for all the isopods. But they're a great, great sources. Any one of these are great alternative sources for adding some good quality protein diet, uh, protein to the diet of your isopods. So I think they're absolutely fascinating. Large, impressive size, you know, real cool patterning and colors. They're fairly outgoing. Everything you need in a perfect isopod. These ones require a little bit more attention to their care. But if you can provide those cares, they are truly rewarding. So hopefully you guys enjoyed today's little video on this particular species. And until next time, take care. Uh -huh.